And so we move now to second plenary session, item one. I call to order the second plenary session of the 50th regular session of the General Assembly. We see Jamaica making a request for the floor. Jamaica. Sorry, for the next session. Apologies, Mr. Chair. Okay. Cool. Thank you. Item one, we continue to work with the presentation of the annual report of the Permanent Council, document AG slash doc 5691 slash 20 and its addenda. I offer the floor to the Chair of the Permanent Council, Ambassador Audrey Marks, Permanent Representative of Jamaica to the OAS, who will present the Permanent Council's report on its activities since the 49th regular session of the General Assembly. Ambassador Marks, please take the floor. Ambassador Marks, can you kindly request the floor again, please? Thank you, Mr. President. Distinguished heads of delegation, Secretary General Luis Amagro, Assistant Secretary General Ambassador Nesta Mendez, representatives of the member states of the OAS, prominent observers to the OAS, representatives of international organizations, representatives of civil society, special guests, ladies and gentlemen. As a current chair of the Permanent Council, I'm honored to deliver to this plenary session of the 50th regular session of the General Assembly, the annual report of the Permanent Council of the Organization of American States for the period from July 2019 to October 2020. This report comprises five documents, which have been published with classification AG doc. 5691-20 and addenda. I will now highlight certain elements it contains that I believe should be brought to the attention of the assembly at this time. Document AG-5691-20 contains information on the officers of the council, its rules and procedures the topics addressed in fulfillment of specific General Assembly mandates, and a summary of the process of preparing for General Assembly sessions. It also gives an overview of the reports received on the electoral observer missions deployed in a number of countries in the region, elections of officers of the OS organs, agencies, and entities, and takes an inventory of the draft declarations and draft resolutions that the Permanent Council has referred to this General Assembly. The second document, classified as AG 5691 20 1, contains reports by the various Permanent Council committees and working groups concerning the outcome of their work during the 62 formal meetings and 22 informal meetings held during the period covered by this report. The Committee on Juridical and Political Affairs, the Committee on Administrative and Budgetary Affairs, and the Committee on Inter-American Summits and Management and Civil Society Participation in OS Activities. The third document, AG Doc 5691-20, contains the draft resolutions that member states had agreed upon in preparation for the virtual 50th regular session of the OAS General Assembly. The fourth document, AG Doc 5691-20 and three, contains the draft resolutions submitted before the 50th regular session of the assembly opened and on which the member states had not reached agreement. Hence the recommendation that they now be considered by the General Committee of the Assembly. 
the fifth document ag slash 5691 slash 19 add four contains the annual reports of the organs agencies and entities of the organization presented pursuant to article 91.f of the OAS charter the activities of the council open the current period with a special meeting of July 15th, 2019, and concluded with its last meeting on October 16th, 2020. The council held a total of 69 sittings, 31 of them regular meetings, 33 special meetings, two, two other meetings, and three joint meetings with the Inter-American Council for Integral Development. It should be noted that starting in April 2020, the Permanent Council has had to meet virtually due to the crisis brought about by the COVID-19 pandemic. Accordingly, and to enable the Permanent Council to function without affecting or modifying the rules of procedure, the Member States agreed by resolution CP Res 1150 bracket 2280-20, that meetings would be virtual until the necessary conditions are in place for on-site meetings. Likewise, to facilitate efficient functioning of this body, the member states agreed provisionally to a document entitled Proposed Modus Operandi for the Permanent Council during the extraordinary period of the pandemic. CP slash INF 8685-20. 31 of the 69 meetings held were virtual. Mr. President, I must point out that the report I'm delivering reflects the activities carried out over the past 15 months by various permanent council chairs, namely Ambassador Yolande Yvonne Smith, permanent representative of, representative of Grenada, Ambassador Rita Claveri, Prominent Representative of Guatemala, Ambassador Riyad Insunali, Prominent Representative of Guyana, Ambassador Leon Charles, Prominent Representative of Haiti, and Ambassador Luis Fernando Cordero, Prominent Representative of, of Honduras. I just to undertaken by the Prominent Council, Mr. President, mindful that the written report gives a more detailed account of the activities carried out. During this period, the Permanent Council received 19 Ministers of Foreign Affairs of the Americas, as well as public and private figures from across the hemisphere. Detailed list is contained in section B3 of, of the report. The Permanent Council also received 10 reports from electoral observation missions and was also involved in the preparation for the 54th special session of the General Assembly to elect the OAS Secretary General and Assistant Secretary General. This was held in Washington, DC. The council was engaged as well in the preparations of this virtual 50th regular session of the General Assembly. During this period, it approved 32 resolutions which are listed in chapter three of the report, in addition to which it considered matters per dates arising from the General Assembly resolutions, as well as reports submitted as required under Article 91.F of the Charter of American States. The latter included in addendum four to the report of the Prominent Council. Clearly, the Prominent Council and its subsidiary body very active and relevant, holding 173 meetings during this period. Mr. President, during my chair of the Prominent Council, I have reaffirmed the usefulness, relevance, and importance of the organization. The strength of the OAS as a preferred forum for hemispheric level policy dialogue is quite evident. And, and the commitment. So, so too are its drawing power, the dedication and commitment of the staff of the General Secretariat and its other organs, agencies, and entities. 
the invaluable input from civil society organizations and other social actors, and the solidarity of prominent observers. The OAS, the House of the Americas, brings together creative diversity of multiple sectors for the purpose of enhancing the well being of our citizens. In closing, I'd like to thank the SG, the Assistant SG, and his team at the Office of the Secretary of the General Assembly, the meeting of consultation of Ministers of Foreign Affairs, the Prominent Council, and their bodies, they have all displayed utmost professionalism and commitment during the more than 131 formal meetings that enabled us to come to this 50th regular session of the General Assembly with tangible results in hand. Mr. President, I thank you and the delegations for your attention. Thank you. Ambassador Marks, we thank you for the presentation of that report very fulsome and very erudite, the contents of which includes the draft resolutions agreed upon by the permanent council and transmitted for consideration by the General Assembly. That having been said, I suggest, suggest taking note of the annual report of the permanent council and proceeding with the adoption of the draft resolutions that already enjoy consensus as contained in document AG slash NOC 5691 slash 20 Addendum two, namely, one, draft resolution, support for the follow-up to the Summit of the Americas process. Two, increasing and strengthening the participation of civil society and social actors in the activities of the Organization of American States and in the Summit of the Americas process. Update three, update of the rules of procedure of the Permanent Council and its subsidiary bodies for advancing hemispheric security, a multi-dimensional approach. Five, the key role of the Organization of American States in the advancement of telecommunications slash information and communications technologies through the Inter-American Telecommunications Commission, CETEL. Six, towards an inter-American business charter. Seven, promoting the hemispheric response to climate change in the context of the COVID-19 pandemic. Eight, program budget of the organization for 2021. Nine, advancing hemispheric initiatives on integral development. 10, challenges to food and nutrition security in the Americas in the face of the COVID-19 pandemic in the framework of the plan of action of Guatemala 2019. If there are no comments, we shall consider the draft resolutions in question adopted. Resolutions are adopted. As we can see, the report that was presented and the documents we have just adopted showcase the complex work that the Permanent Council has carried out since July 2019. For that reason, on behalf of the General Assembly, I would like to pay a public tribute to the permanent representatives of the member states to the OAS for their invaluable contributions to the implementation of the hemispheric agenda. I would also like to take to make a special mention of the permanent representatives of Grenada, Guatemala, Guyana, Haiti, Honduras, and Jamaica, who have chaired the council from July 2019 to date. Our grateful thanks go to them for their hard work, their commitment, and dedication. I take this opportunity to remind the distinguished delegations that the draft declaration on the question of the Malvinas Islands will be considered by the General Assembly during the fourth plenary session. We now move to item two, annual report of the Inter-American Council for Integral Development, 2019-2021. 2019-2020, I'm sorry. Continuing with the items on the agenda, we shall now turn our attention to the presentation by the chair of the Inter-American Council for Integral Development, Ambassador Leon Charles, permanent representative of Haiti to the OAS. Ambassador Charles, please take the floor.
Merci beaucoup, Monsieur le Président. Messieurs et Mesdames les ministres des Affaires étrangères, Monsieur le Secrétaire général, Monsieur le Secrétaire général adjoint, collègues représentants permanents, autres hauts fonctionnaires et délégués, bonjour. Je suis profondément honoré de représenter le Conseil interaméricain pour le développement intégré CIDI et de présenter à l'Assemblée générale le rapport annuel du Conseil pour le développement intégré et le projet de résolution intitulé « Encourager les initiatives continentales en matière de développement intégré, promotion de la résilience pour examen ». Monsieur le Président, alors que nous nous réunissons virtuellement pour la première fois de notre histoire, nous sommes parfaitement conscients du fait que deux périodes distinctes marquent l'année sous revue. La période pré-COVID-19 et la période pré-COVID-19. La région avant COVID-19 était confrontée à de profonds défis de faiblesse structurelle dans les systèmes de protection sociale, les soins de santé et l'éducation. Des taux élevés d'informalité sur les marchés du travail, faible croissance économique, faible taux de productivité et d'innovation, infrastructures insuffisantes, des niveaux élevés de pauvreté et d'inégalité et un mécontentement social croissant. Ainsi, bien que la pandémie soit avant tout une crise de santé publique, elle a été amplifiée par les inégalités et la faiblesse structurelle pour générer des crises économiques sociales et politiques qui ont bouleversé les progrès visant à atteindre tous les objectifs de développement durable. Nous devons maintenant faire face aux écarts grandissants d'accès à la technologie, à l'éducation, aux opportunités économiques et à la mobilité sociale. Chers collègues, alors que nous travaillons à la reprise, l'Amérique latine et les Caraïbes doivent relever le défi de la transformation numérique et du développement d'infrastructures et de services numériques pour soutenir la croissance d'économies compétitives et inclusives. Les bouleversements de l'économie mondiale et des chaînes de valeur devraient également nous inciter à repenser la façon dont nous nous connectons à l'économie mondiale. Nous devons soutenir la reprise, la résilience et la compétitivité des micro, petites et moyennes entreprises, en tant que pilier de la structure productive de nos États membres. La région doit utiliser ce moment pour envisager un avenir nouveau et meilleur pour l'éducation qui s'appuie sur une collectivité numérique améliorée pour transformer nos systèmes éducatifs au profit de tous les étudiants de nos États membres. En tant que deuxième région du monde la plus sujette aux catastrophes, l'Amérique latine et les Caraïbes doivent servir, saisir par nos cette dynamique de reconstruction pour jeter les bases d'une production et d'une consommation éco écologiquement durable et socialement inclusive. Nous devons également renforcer nos systèmes de préparation aux catastrophes, d'intervention et de gestion des risques. Chers collègues, malgré les nombreux ouverts que cette pandémie a infligés, nous, nous ne pouvons pas renoncer à notre engagement à atteindre le programme de développement durable à l'horizon 2030 et ses objectifs. Nous reconnaissons que la coopération et la collaboration qui englobe toutes les parties prenantes, y compris les gouvernements, le secteur privé, les universités et la société civile au niveau national, régional et international, sont essentielles pour nous pour reconstruire mieux. Je suis fier de dire que dans cette organisation qui a une longue histoire de promotion des partenariats pour le développement dans les Amériques, nos États membres ont répondu aux crises en se soutenant mutuellement. Alors que nous évaluons la voie que nous devons emprunter pour récupérer et reconstruire nos pays, nous continuons à valoriser le travail de l'OEA qui aide les États membres à développer des sociétés équitables, prospères, démocratiques et sûres que nos citoyens exigent. Le Conseil interaméricain pour le développement intégré, que j'ai eu le plaisir et l'honneur de présider, offre un forum précieux pour le dialogue politique, sur les politiques qui créeront le cadre d'action. Au-delà de ce dialogue, cependant, le travail du CIDI et de son secrétaire exécutif CIDI, en tant que bras de développement de l'organisation, offre une voie d'engagement pour faire avancer les guides sur les tâches d'urgence auxquelles nous sommes confrontés. 
En ce moment critique, j'exhorte les États membres à approfondir leur engagement avec le Conseil au plus haut niveau. Nous sommes plus forts lorsque nous sommes unis. Les travaux du CIDI, que j'ai eu l'honneur de présider pendant cette période, et ceux présidés par mes chers collègues, l'ambassadrice Rita Claveri de Stioli, du Guatemala, de juin à décembre 2019, et l'ambassadeur Riyad Nsanali de la Guyane, ont impliqué un dialogue de fond sur les questions suivantes. Partenariat public-privé pour le développement. Décarboner le développement des Amériques. Compétitivité. Malnutrition infantile de la région. La crise de l'eau et de l'assainissement et ses effets sur la santé humaine. Promouvoir une infrastructure énergétique, résiliente et durable dans les Amériques, le rôle de l'ECPA. Et combler les écarts et lacunes technologiques dans les Amériques. Environnement, reconstruire mieux la clé d'une reprise résiliente. De plus, les réunions ministérielles, les réunions des commissions interaméricaines suivantes ont eu lieu. La dixième réunion interaméricaine des ministres d'éducation de, dans le cadre du CIDI, les 8 et 9 juillet 2019, présidée par Antigua et Barbuda, siège de l'OEA. La 20e réunion du comité exécutif de la Commission interaméricaine des ports, CECIP, sur l'île de Wotan, le 17 juillet 2019, Honduras. La 8e réunion interaméricaine des ministres et hauts fonctionnaires chargés de la culture dans le cadre du CIDI, les 19 et 20 septembre 2019, Barbata. La réunion des groupes de travail de la Conférence interaméricaine des ministres du travail, laquelle s'est tenue à Quito, du 3 au 5 décembre 2019 en Équateur. La deuxième réunion spécialisée des autorités de haut niveau sur la coopération, tenue le 31 octobre et le 1er novembre 2019 au siège de l'OEA. La neuvième réunion ordinaire de la Commission interaméricaine de la science et technologie, les 11 et 12 décembre 2019 au siège de l'OEA. La quatrième réunion ministérielle du Partenariat pour l'énergie et le climat des Amériques, tenu les 27 et 28 février 2020 à la Jamaïque. La deuxième réunion spéciale de la Commission interaméricaine du tourisme, qui s'est tenue virtuellement le 14 août 2020. Monsieur le Président, l'année 2019-2020 a représenté une période importante de réalisation pour le secrétariat dans ses efforts pour soutenir le travail de développement durable et inclusif pour les États membres. Étant donné le peu de temps alloué, je n'en soulignerai que quelques-uns. C'est dit effectivement renforcer les synergies au sein et entre les domaines et renforcer le lien entre la discussion politique et l'action programmatique. Au cours des huit derniers mois, le secrétariat a formé de nouvelles alliances et partenariats et repositionné les programmes et initiatives existants pour répondre aux besoins émergents des États membres dans leur réponse aux défis complexes occasionné par la pandémie COVID-19. Les initiatives récemment lancées sur Facebook et WhatsApp Business et le programme des centres de développement des petites entreprises des Caraïbes ont fourni aux micro, petites et moyennes entreprises et aux décideurs des opportunités de renforcement des capacités et des outils pour les aider à réagir, à se rétablir et à renforcer leur résilience. En outre, la numérisation de plus de 60 000 MPME de 10 États membres a accru leur visibilité et leur participation au commerce électronique. Prospecta Americas, lancé en collaboration avec Concitec du Pérou et Mincencias de Colombie, soutiendra le partage de bonnes pratiques en matière de prospective technologique et établira des centres d'excellence interaméricains de prospective sur dix technologies transformatrices pour, former, pour fournir pardon, des solutions de développement durable aux États membres. Le réseau interaméricain de compétitivité, RIAC, a partagé plus de 220 initiatives de 23 pays dans l'accélérateur d'idées RIAC COVID-19 sur les outils technologiques, les solutions de santé, les initiatives de soutien aux entreprises et les plans de réponse économique et de relance mis en œuvre par les États membres en réponse à la pandémie. 
le CEDI a mobilisé de nouvelles sources de financement pour des projets dans le bassin de la Plata et a fourni une assistance technique au directeur de l'énergie dans 22 États membres pour encourager l'utilisation de données fiables, scientifiques et empiriques dans la région de l'énergie, le développement des énergies renouvelables et la surveillance de la qualité de l'air. Les programmes et initiatives du CEDI dans le cadre de l'agenda interaméricain de l'éducation ont également aidé les États membres à réagir à la plus grande perturbation des systèmes éducatifs de l'histoire. La série des séminaires en ligne du réseau interaméricain de formation des enseignants, COVID-19, enseigner les STEM en quarantaine a amélioré les capacités de plus de 86 500 éducateurs dans les États membres. Le programme éducatif Pro Futuro est en voie de former plus de 1 200 enseignants, rejoignant plus de 23 000 enfants dans des environnements vulnérables dans cinq États membres des Caraïbes. Dans le cadre du programme élargi, 3 400 enseignants supplémentaires de 26 États membres participent à des programmes de formation afin d'améliorer leur capacité à offrir une éducation virtuelle de qualité. En plus de près de 6 000 bourses d'études basées sur les besoins et 129 prêts sans intérêt accordés à des citoyens dans 34 États membres, nous avons également fourni 51 subventions d'urgence totalisant 102 000 dollars à des étudiants internationaux aux États-Unis pour compenser les défis financiers créés par la pandémie. Le programme élargi de bourse d'études de l'OEA avec le Chili a fourni une certification technique cruciale à près de 2 000 ressortissants de la CARICOM. Après le début de la pandémie, le travail du CEDI sur le, sur le travail et l'emploi a pivoté pour aider les États membres à faire face à ces impacts sur le travail. La réunion du groupe de travail YACMIL, qui s'est tenue en septembre 2020, a porté sur le télétravail et l'économie de plateforme la dimension de genre de la crise, l'extension de la couverture de la protection sociale, le renforcement du dialogue social et le respect de la santé et de la sécurité au travail. Monsieur le Président, ce ne sont là que quelques-unes des nouvelles réalisations détaillées dans le rapport à l'Assemblée générale. Monsieur le Président, en ce moment charnière, le programme de développement de l'OE a besoin de notre pleine et résolue attention. Les réactions politiques de nos États membres à la pandémie ont été audacieuses, mais d'autres mesures seront nécessaires à mesure que nous sortirons des mesures de confinement et de verrouillage. Comme l'a dit le président John Fitzgerald Kennedy, en cas de crise, soyez conscient du danger, mais reconnaissez l'opportunité. La manière dont nous sortirons de cette crise sera déterminée par notre capacité à relever ces défis et ces opportunités. Cela, je suis sûr que mes distingués collègues le savent. Ce n'est pas le travail d'un pays ou d'une institution particulière. C'est une cause autour de laquelle... Nous, les acteurs, comme nous l'avons vu, nous renforçons, nous, nous permettent d'être bien plus que la somme de nos partis. La clé de cette voie à suivre sera la redéfinition des priorités du pilier développement, reflétée en termes réels dans le financement durable et adéquat du travail de développement de l'organisation. La mesure dans laquelle nous continuons d'évoluer en termes de pertinence et de répondre aux besoins actuels et émergents de nos citoyens dépend de la détermination de nos États membres et du dévouement de notre personnel du secrétariat. Je suis convaincu que nous sommes à la hauteur de la tâche. En terminant, j'exprime ma gratitude aux États membres qui ont accueilli des réunions ou présidé des comités interaméricains. Je remercie les présidents des divers organes du CIDI pour leur soutien et le travail accompli cette année. Je salue également la secrétaire exécutive Kim Osborne et je lui offre ma reconnaissance pour son leadership et le travail acharné et le dévouement de son personnel. Le travail a permis à cet organe de réaliser la vision et les mandats de l'organisation et de répondre de manière cohérente et efficace 
aux défis de cette époque sans précédent. Je nous exhorte à continuer de travailler à travers ce qui est devenu notre nouvelle normalité et à nous rapprocher d'une région des Amériques inclusive et durable. Monsieur le Président, nous devons maintenir l'élan. Je vous remercie. Ambassador Charles, thank you very much for your presentation. Um, the chair would like to take this opportunity to thank CIDI for its work since July 2019. We now move to agenda item three, dialogue of heads of delegation. We shall now begin the dialogue of heads of delegation on the topic of this regular session of the General Assembly, facing the challenges of COVID-19 in the hemisphere a collaborative approach to address vulnerabilities and build resilience in times of crisis based on the four pillars of the OAS. In accordance with the agreement of procedural matters we have just approved, the floor will be given using the Kudo platform following the order of precedence that has already been determined by the drawing of lots and to those delegations that have chosen to submit pre-recorded presentations in advance. They will be shown during this session following that same order of precedence. I would also wish to remind you that presentations are expected to not exceed six minutes per delegation, so that the time allotted to this item on the Assembly's agenda will allow for all the delegations to participate. Accordingly, I'm extremely pleased now to offer the floor to the head of delegation for Antigua and Barbuda, His Excellency, Ambassador Sir Ronald Saunders. Thank you, Mr. President. Mr. President, this 50th General Assembly should have been an occasion for great celebration. Instead, it is being held under a cloud of fear and uncertainty that hangs over the entire planet. In the words of the UN Secretary General, a microscopic virus has brought the world to its knees, laying bare its fragilities. The world will not get up. It will not stand up unless all nations, large and small, act together. As long as the novel coronavirus lives among any community of mankind, all mankind remains in danger. It looms large across the globe, jumping across the divides of national borders and defying the belief that rich nations can survive while poorer nations succumb. Even the most powerful countries have been unable to stop the spread of the virus. And narrow political nationalist policies that undermine international cooperation are simply making matters worse. Of course, the poor and vulnerable are already, are already the first to suffer from the economic impact of COVID-19. There are no trends identifiable today, Mr. President, no programs or policies that offer hope of narrowing the gap between rich and poor, let alone of bridging it. The countries of the Caribbean, from which no pandemic has ever originated, and from which no international financial crisis has ever begun are among the most hardest hit. Already in many of our countries, a decade or more of economic growth and social development has been set back in seven short months, and they cannot now attain the sustainable development goals set by the United Nations. Unemployment has jumped dramatically, in some cases to 50%. Businesses have closed, some never to open their doors again. 
savings have depleted. Poverty has increased. Malnutrition has returned. And so too has hunger and an increase in crime. And governments of small countries, unable to print money as governments in powerful countries do, cannot support the private sector and they find it difficult to meet their own obligations. The international financial institutions, constrained by rules set by those who make their policies, deny concessional financing to small and vulnerable states on the basis of flawed criteria. The Paris Club demands payment of age-old debts, knowing fully well that states crippled by the, the effects of the pandemic are unable to pay. Yet, Mr. President, none will listen to the pleas for debt rescheduling and debt forgiveness, without which these nations could become basket cases with all the consequences that social and political instability will unleash. The pandemic has magnified inequalities, injustices, and unfairness. In my own country, apart from the World Health Organization and the Pan American Health Organization, for which we are immense, to which we are immensely grateful, my country has had to curb and contain the coronavirus from its own depleted resources managing to keep deaths down to only three, confirmed cases to 119, and active cases currently at 15. But Mr. Chairman, not one cent came to Antigua and Barbuda from the international financial institutions to help my country struggle against the health and economic impacts of COVID-19. That is why, Mr. President, this organization cannot afford to ignore the calamitous effects of the virus on the health of our peoples and on the economies of our countries. While we all look forward to relief from the stranglehold of COVID-19, many of us know that when and if it passes, we will continue to live in fear of the existential threat posed to our countries by climate change. The unyielding fist of climate change grips the throats of our countries. Some member states of the US have decided that the purpose of this organization is solely political, and therefore development and security issues are less relevant than democracy and human rights. We in the Caribbean strongly uphold democracy and human rights, including free and fair elections. That's why we actively fought for democracy in Guyana for five months between April and August of this year. It is why we vigorously applauded it in the transparent and peaceful elections of, of in Suriname, Trinidad and Tobago, Jamaica, the Dominican Republic, and St. Kitts Nevis in the last few months. It is also why we loudly acclaim the voice of the people in Bolivia, who two days ago overwhelmingly restored democracy in their country through the power of the ballot. But we also know, Mr. President, that the guarantees of democracy and human rights anywhere in the world are human development and human security. For democracy to survive, development must thrive. Therefore, if this organization is to re remain relevant to the needs of its peoples, it needs to recognize that the world does not operate in separate compartments. Every activity is interlinked and integrated. In this regard, the OAS should be a unified voice in advocating for strong and decisive action on climate financing, not as a concession, not as an act of generosity, what is a moral, political, and environmental responsibility. OAS member states should also be a unified voice for the renegotiation and rescheduling of foreign debt and for the affordable procurement of vaccines for all when one is found to counter COVID-19. 
Integration and collective action in the OS should not be an option or a choice. It should be an imperative for all, rich and poor, large and small. COVID-19 has reminded us that no one is safe until everybody is safe. Mr. President, our hemisphere has always been an area of diversity, but we can find commonality, if not unity, through respective, respectful dialogue and a genuine search for peaceful and beneficial solutions to our challenges. My delegation urges that we reaffirm our commitment to such dialogue and in the process, re-examine the governance of our organization to place member states where they should be at the helm of this organization, including on matters such as the right to protect. These are serious matters, Mr. President, with serious implications for people the world over. They ought not to be left to any one person or to any one group. The unity of human needs requires a functional multilateral system that rejects the bullying doctrine of exclusion and imposition and respects the democratic principles of participation and consent. Now, more than ever, Hemispheric solidarity is urgently required, putting first, not the advantage of any one of our nations, but the welfare of all of them. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you very much for your presentation, sir. Thank you very much. We now offer the floor to the foreign minister from Argentina, His Excellency Felipe Carlos Sola. Excellency, please take the floor. Señor presidente, quiero saludar a, a usted, señor presidente, al señor secretario general, a los señores jefes de delegación y a los señores y de, señoras delegados. Y en primer lugar, solidarizarme con las familias y los afectos de quienes han sido víctimas de COVID en toda nuestra América en estos largos meses que venimos pasando. En ese sentido, con respecto al COVID, nuestra política ha sido mantener la prioridad de un sistema de salud sustentable como la única manera humanitaria y digna de enfrentar la pandemia, dando una, una oportunidad a todos, sin que nadie quede afuera. Defender el empleo y sostener a los que lo necesitan, con el costo fiscal que esto implica, sigue siendo el esfuerzo más pesado, pero lo seguiremos haciendo hasta que podamos reconstruir la economía. Señor Presidente de la República Argentina, Cree que en estos días es bueno recordar la carta de la OEA. Nos hemos comprometido, según ella, todos nosotros, a darle a los nuestros una tierra de libertad favorable al desarrollo de su personalidad y para realizar sus justas aspiraciones. No son las imposiciones ni las sanciones, menos aún en plena pandemia, lo que, han hecho, lo que ha hecho esta organización un referente de solidaridad y convivencia. Los derechos humanos, señor presidente, son una política fundamental del Estado argentino desde el año 1983 en especial. Los tratados de derechos humanos tienen en nuestro país, y creo que en varios también, rango constitucional. Por eso decimos que el sistema interamericano de derechos humanos, que es modelo en el mundo en materia de protección y de promoción, debe ser defendido. Y debe cuidarse de no poner en tela de juicio a quienes lo integran, porque viven muchas veces situaciones difíciles que requieren de un respaldo institucional. La República Argentina va a denunciar la violación de todos los derechos humanos por parte de los poderes constituidos, donde sea, sin distinciones. Hemos votado en Ginebra, apoyando el informe Bachelet sobre el caso Venezuela. Lo mismo Habíamos hecho en agosto, cuando la alta comisionada de, denunció los hechos ocurridos en Bolivia. Resaltamos su trabajo, el de la alta comisionada, y queremos que más allá de las circunstancias políticas, funcione en Caracas una oficina con el poder 
y la dimensión suficiente como para poder prevenir problemas y actuar en la defensa de los derechos. Quiero decir, señor presidente, en esta honorable asamblea, que creemos que el secretario general debe actuar en concordancia con la acción y la política decidida por sus órganos políticos, los órganos políticos de esta organización, en cumplimiento de su función de promover las relaciones económicas, sociales, jurídicas, educativas, científicas y culturales entre todos los Estados miembros. No se cumple con este mandato adoptando posiciones personales o que no guardan el mismo sentido y énfasis conforme al país o gobierno del que se trate, mucho menos cuando terminan alimentando el problema que debiera contribuirse a solucionar. La OEA, señor presidente, debe ser contención, mediación y sobre todo garante siempre de la pacificación en cada lugar de nuestra América. Nunca juez o gendarme político. Señor presidente, celebramos las elecciones del domingo en Bolivia que dieron el triunfo a la fórmula encabezada por el presidente electo Luis Arce y el vice David Choquehuanca. Bolivia es un país hermano y de fuerte relación con la Argentina. Ha sufrido mucho el último año, pero el pueblo ha encontrado la salida. Hemos venido marcando en cada oportunidad nuestra oposición a los bloqueos y las sanciones impuestas a Venezuela, como se hiciera hace muchos, desde hace muchos años con Cuba. Esta política agrava la vida cotidiana, perjudica a los más pobres y no ha logrado más que endurecer las conductas y los corazones de aquellos a los que está destinado, los que están en la mira. Lamento decir que no hemos sido incluidos en las negociaciones sobre los proyectos en relación a Venezuela y Nicaragua que se tratarán en esta asamblea. Creo que seremos testigos una vez más de algo que nos preocupa muchísimo y que está ocurriendo desde hace unos años, que es la división de nuestra América Latina, basada exclusivamente en qué piensa cada país sobre Venezuela. Integración, producción, crecimiento económico, cooperación para la salud, relaciones en general entre todos nuestros países, son temas postergados en nuestras relaciones frente a uno solo, ¿no? que es cómo pensamos, de nuestra, cuál es nuestra posición frente a Venezuela. Mientras tanto sigue nuestra postergación como sociedad, en nuestro atraso relativo en, en relación a otros continentes, pero nos peleamos por eso. La República Argentina se pregunta cómo se llegó a esta situación y se pregunta también a quién le conviene. Señor Presidente, la República Argentina copatrocina un proyecto de resolución de esta Asamblea General sobre cambio climático. La situación de endeudamiento de los países en desarrollo debe estar acompañada de recursos financieros aportados por los que más tienen, porque el problema del cambio climático es de todos, Afecta a todos y algunos que no cumplan afectan a los demás, sean pobres o ricos. Por lo tanto, podemos frenarlo solamente entre todos y hay que tener en cuenta cómo sale cada uno, cómo saldrá el día de mañana cada uno de la pandemia para volver sobre el cambio climático, que es uno de los temas centrales del mundo y recordemos la encíclica de Laudato Si del Papa Francisco. Con respecto a la política de género, quiero decir que la pandemia ha mostrado claramente la incidencia de la desigualdad entre hombres y mujeres. Y es necesario que tomemos conciencia de que debemos avanzar en la perspectiva de género a mayor velocidad de lo que venimos haciéndolo. Vamos a apoyar las estrategias sobre la gestión del riesgo de desastres, siguiendo lo asumido por la comunidad internacional en la Agenda 2030 para el desarrollo sostenido. Queremos decir respecto a la seguridad a la seguridad en el sentido multidimensional del problema, que es clave la cooperación regional en la prevención y la persecución de delitos de la trata de personas, del tráfico ilícito de migrantes y de la fabricación y tráfico ilícito de armas pequeñas, sus partes y municiones. Y obviamente también, señor presidente, del tráfico de drogas y estupefacientes. Vamos a colaborar de manera de mantener un ciberespacio libre, abierto, resiliente, pacífico y seguro para poder compartir los beneficios de manera equitativa. Vamos a tener que incrementar la conectividad y la capacidad de, en habilidades digitales, tarea que lleva adelante hoy la OEA. Señor Presidente, 
señor secretario general, señores jefes y jefas de delegación y señores y señores delegados. Para terminar, agradezco especialmente el apoyo a las representaciones de esta organización a la fórmula para reanudar las negociaciones entre Argentina y el Reino Unido y resolver de forma pacífica y definitiva la disputa de soberanía sobre las Islas Malvinas, Georgia del Sur, Sandwich del Sur y los espacios marítimos circundantes. Cuestión central en nuestra política exterior. Muchas gracias a todos. Thank you, Excellency, for your presentation. As the Bahamas and Canada have agreed to switch places in the speaking order, as such, I now invite the Foreign Minister of Canada, His Excellency Francois Philippe Champagne, to take the floor. Please take the floor, my friend. Minister, you have to activate your camera and your microphone at the center bottom of your screen. Sorry, yes. Excellencies, I was so keen to speak that I started before I put the camera and the volume on. So let me start because I was praising both the Secretary General and you, Mr. Chair. So I would want to make sure you hear that. So let me start again to say, distinguished colleagues, uh, it was very interesting to listen to many of the statements that were made before. Secretary General Almagro, great to see you, although we all wish we would be closer to you, but that's the new world. We have to do things virtually. Assistant Secretary General, thank you for your uh, good work. It is obviously a pleasure uh, to be with you all today. Excellency Minister and Phil, our dear friend, great to see you in the chair, my friend, and thank you for presiding over the very first virtual General Assembly in these times of great challenges, uh, great consequences, but I think great opportunities as well uh, for the people in our hemisphere. 2023 represents an important milestone for Canada. Our 30th uh, anniversary as a full member of the Organization of American States. And as you can imagine all, we are very proud to be with part of this organization for now 30 years. This General Assembly colleagues come at a critical moment in our region's history. COVID-19 has hit our atmosphere hard, as we have heard many times this morning, with the impact felt throughout the whole region. Our thoughts are with all those who have lost loved ones in this terrible virus. COVID-19 has exposed the fragility of our health systems and inequalities in access to care. It has also made clear that our efforts to eliminate sexual and gender-based violence must be reinforced. The pandemic threatens the decades of progress on poverty reduction and achieving gender equality that we have worked so hard, all of us, to attain. We're also witnessing increasing insecurity, instability, and further marginalization of vulnerable individuals. Faced with this diagnosis, we all must act together to ensure that what started as a health crisis does not turn into a food or financial crisis in our hemisphere that would turn to a, into a humanitarian crisis. Our response will shape our region for generations to come. Canada is committed to cooperating with our fellow countries in the hemisphere to face the pandemic and its consequences. None of us will be successfully recovering if countries outside our borders are not secure. We must all foster greater solidarity and dialogue and listen to one another's needs even on issues where we do not see eye to eye. This is no time for polarized debate. We need to revitalize and empower our hemispheric institutions for the betterment of our region and our people as it will save lives and livelihoods. We must reconfirm the importance we attach to the OAS core principles 
and demonstrate our unshakable commitment to democracy, human rights, security, and sustainable development. We must, with urgency and purpose, collectively reaffirm the relevance of the Inter-American Democratic Charter and strengthen its implementation as a key foundational instrument for our hemisphere. We are determined to support the most vulnerable and marginalized who are bearing the brunt of this crisis in many, many countries. They include women and girls, indigenous and Afro-descendants peoples, migrants and refugees, and the LGBTQ2I community. We must work together with our private sector to push for innovative solutions. Our entrepreneurs and companies are critical to the economic recovery and lasting prosperity of our atmosphere. We must harness the power of the private sector. Canada has pledged over a billion dollar in direct support to the global pandemic response. This includes significant support to the Pan American Health Organization and other partners to save lives, protect health workers, and slow the spread of COVID-19 in our hemisphere. We're also working hard to the equitable development of a safe, effective, and affordable COVID-19 vaccines, therapeutics, and diagnostics. Just last month, Prime Minister Trudeau announced a 220 million contribution to the COVID-19 vaccine global access facility to purchase doses for low and middle income countries. Now, let me say a few words about our friends in the Caribbean. Prime Minister Trudeau was pleased to join our good friend, the Jamaican Prime Minister Holness and the UN Secretary General Guterres in convening a second leaders meeting on financing for development, including in the Caribbean. And I think, dear friends, this is one of the most promising initiatives that I think we should all uh, pay attention to and contribute because that's the first time uh, issues of financing are discussed within the framework of the UN. Our Caribbean friends face a particularly daunting challenge in COVID-19. And I spoke to almost all of you uh, during the crisis and we made sure we would put air assets and be there for you as we have always been. So we applaud the measure Caribbean states have put in place to contain the virus spread. To my Caribbean friends and partners, I hope we can continue working together on pandemic recovery and towards strengthening economic and climate resilience. There's much more work to do, but we are committed to be partner with you in respect and as equal partners in this fight of the pandemic and flagging the biggest challenge that we have. When it comes to democracy, bolstering trust in our democratic institutions in the face of COVID starts with meeting popular demands to achieve greater equality, transparency, accountability, and inclusion. Despite challenges, Canada was pleased to see the will of the people and the democratic process ultimately upheld in Guyana this past August, including thanks to the continued support of the OAS, CARICOM, and other partners. In good news, Canada would also like to congratulate Luis Acre on his election as president of Bolivia recently. Canada commends the Bolivian people and their electoral authorities for their strong commitment in ensuring free and fair election in a transparent and very inclusive process. Restoring popular trust in democracy is also fundamental to curtailing growing authoritarian regimes in the region. Canada, like many, many, many countries, remains deeply concerned about the situation in Venezuela. The UN fact-finding mission's recent report confirms the crimes against humanity have been committed by the Maduro regime. As member of the OAS, we must work together to address this crisis afflicting our own hemisphere. It is only through dialogue with one another that we will find a solution. Canada will continue to work towards greater 
and even more united international pressure applied to the Maduro regime. We are committed to working at the OAS within the Lima Group as, the Lima group as co-chair, the group of friends of the Quito process, and with other partners to that end. The human rights situation and the ongoing political crisis in Nicaragua are also of much concerns. Canada calls on the government of Nicaragua to end all human rights violations and defend media freedom and work within the OS on elections. The free press is the lifeblood of a democratic society. On November 16, Canada will co-host the second global conference for media freedom with our colleagues from Botswana. We will work hard to make it a productive and meaningful meeting. And to you all, I would like to invite you to join the Media Freedom Coalition. That's a formal invitation to all the colleagues online today. Canada's feminist approach to its foreign and international assistance policies remains at the very center of our diplomatic development and trade and humanitarian efforts in the region. We must redouble our efforts to curtail sexual and gender-based violence in the region, which has dramatically increased with stay-at-home orders. Indigenous populations have also been disproportionately impacted and it hard by the pandemic. Supporting their pandemic recovery through the affirmation of rights, respect, cooperation, and partnership are key priorities of our domestic and international agendas, including at the OAS. In conclusion, I leave you distinguished colleagues by renewing my call for all of us to first stand together during these challenging times. There's never been a better time, Secretary General, to show the world that the OAS can act together decisively and putting the lives and livelihood of people front and center in our action. To intensify our cooperation in the face of this pandemic, to show our citizens across our hemisphere that we are deeply committed, first to fight the pandemic and also to work together on the recovery and to strengthen our support for democracy, human rights and a sustainable and inclusive recovery that restores people's faith in their institutions. There's never been a better time to restore faith and provide hopes to people. Robust hemispheric institution and a strong United OAS is central to our success. And in that, Secretary General and Deputy Secretary General and Chair, you have a particular role as leaders uh, to make sure in Canada will stand with you at every step of the way. We look forward to working with you to end the threat of COVID-19 and to achieve our shared goals of a more just and prosperous hemisphere and a more coordinated approach on key issues. Thank you. Merci. Gracias. Obrigado. Back to you, Chair. Merci, Minister. Thank you very much for your presentation. As colleagues are aware, presentations were provided by some delegations via video. We'll now watch the video presented on behalf of the Minister of Foreign Affairs for Barbados, His Excellency Jerome Walcott. Before we start the video, there is a request on the floor for Nicaragua. Can we, can we invite Nicaragua to the floor? Sí, mu sí, mu muchas gracias, señora presidenta. Eh, eh, <coughs> señor presidente, he solicitado la palabra por cuestión de orden al escuchar la intervención del señor ministro de Relaciones Exteriores de Canadá. No es procedente, esta Asamblea General de la OEA no ha sido convocada para que países miembros de esta organización comiencen a dictar qué es lo que tienen que hacer los gobiernos, los estados y los países en sus políticas internas y en su política internacional. Nicaragua, y lo dejamos muy claro, somos respetuosos y tenemos vocación 
por respetar los derechos humanos. Además de que están establecidos en la Constitución como país, como sociedad, como gobierno, somos amantes de los derechos humanos. Hemos sufrido en dictadura los efectos precisamente de la violación de los derechos humanos y por consiguiente nuestras políticas de Estado están enmarcadas en el cumplimiento, en la promoción de los derechos fundamentales de los nicaragüenses y de los seres humanos que transitan por Nicaragua. He hecho esta intervención porque no aceptamos, Nicaragua no acepta, el gobierno de Reconciliación y Unidad Nacional no acepta la intervención y el señalamiento que ha hecho el señor canciller de Canadá. Exigimos respeto, hacemos énfasis en que hagamos prevalecer el derecho internacional, los principios de la Carta de la ONU, los principios inclusive de la Carta de la OEA que nos llaman precisamente a fortalecer las relaciones amistosas de cooperación, de solidaridad entre los estados y gobiernos, a respetar los principios de no injerencia en los asuntos internos de los estados. Señor presidente, queremos dejar claramente sentada nuestra protesta, nuestra inadmisión, nuestro rechazo a lo expresado por el señor canciller de Canadá. Y decirle a los distinguidas y distinguidos eh, participantes en la Asamblea, no es el objetivo de esta Asamblea hacer señalamientos injerencistas y respetando las relaciones de respeto mutuo que deben existir entre los estados y los pueblos en eh, una organización como la que está realizando hoy eh, esta asamblea. Y quiero dejarlo claro, para el señor ministro del Canadá y para los excelentísimos señores ministros de los demás países participantes y las señoras ministras, que no es procedente, no es correcto estar haciendo señalamiento a los estados y a los gobiernos sobre sus políticas internas, ni a estar insistiendo en políticas de injerencia con relación a los estados y los gobiernos. Es penoso que Canadá siga los dictados de Estados Unidos y aparezca como si fuera un estado subordinado a los Estados Unidos y no lo que es. Muchas gracias, señor presidente, y realmente he hecho uso de la palabra porque esa situación es inaceptable. Muchas gracias. Minister, we take note of your intervention. Your comments will be added to the notes of the record. We now ask the secretary to play the video of the foreign minister of Barbados. Excellency, the Honorable Darwin Henfield, Minister of Foreign Affairs of the Commonwealth of the Bahamas and Chairman of the General Assembly. Excellency, Ambassador Audrey Marks, Permanent Representative of Jamaica to the OAS and Chairperson of the Permanent Council. Excellency, Mr. Luis Almagro, Secretary General. Excellency, Mr. Nestor Mendez, Assistant Secretary General. Honorable Ministers of Foreign Affairs, heads of delegations, delegates, permanent observers, other representatives, specially invited guests, ladies and gentlemen. It is my singular pleasure to bring greetings from Bridgetown, Barbados, on behalf of the government and people of Barbados. Today, catastrophic circumstances have forced us to issue traditional in-person meetings and instead adopt virtual meetings to conduct our business. This is, in my estimation, evidence of the unprecedented and uncertain times that confront us as a hemisphere. However, not all is lost. Our virtual gathering signals our intent to stand together to face the scourge of this pandemic and must be seen as a step in the right direction. It is also a testimony of the need for collective action to tackle common threats, confirming also that multilateralism remains the most effective system to address global threats. Whilst I am honored to be with you today to continue in earnest the critical work of this August body, these are deeply troubling times, particularly for small island development states. Mr. President, the theme chosen for this 50th regular session, facing the challenges of COVID-19 in the hemisphere, a collaborative approach to addressing vulnerabilities and building resilience in times of crisis based on the four pillars of the OAS, is indeed very apt, given the critical juncture 
at which the OAS and the world finds itself. The challenges of COVID-19 are present and like dark clouds looming on the horizon represent an ominous foreboding for all states. Sir, the situation remains grave for many developing low and middle income countries. Not many viable options are available to us. For those of us in the Caribbean community faced with domestic contractions, falling exports and severe difficulties due to flagging tourism receipts, the future is dire. Against this backdrop, many of our states remain in the grip of a very active Atlantic hurricane season. As small developing states, we are very concerned that this crisis may be existential at worst, reversing much of our hard won gains. This pandemic has blatantly exposed our inherent vulnerabilities, which are being exacerbated and undermined by this global health crisis. Yet in many ways, as small states, we have proven resilient. For the most part, our centralized governments have produced nimble rapid response efforts, which have recorded significant public compliance through structured preventative measures. But despite our most valiant efforts, the crisis has and continues to strain our limited health infrastructure and to disrupt valuable supply chains. With travel and tourism at a standstill, many small states, particularly small island development states, are facing acute economic crises and increased unsustainable debt. Only with the support of our multilateral partners can we expand our limited fiscal space to secure more robust preparation for the reopening of our economies and to drive a green and smarter recovery. The pandemic has brought into sharp focus and intensify the inequalities among our countries. The hemispheric response to the global pandemic must embrace international development cooperation as a means to strengthen resilience and to ensure that no state, particularly small vulnerable ones, is left behind. Many states, like those in the Caribbean community, face high external debt burdens, which require complementary external debt suspension or relief programs. Our small states are also particularly vulnerable because of our geographic positioning and our strong dependence on trade. Concomitantly, our limited access to development finance and the disproportionate impact of natural disasters and climate change to our economies further exacerbates our development challenges. As a principal political forum for dialogue between the countries of the Americas, the OAS can play a pivotal role. Through this forum, member states collectively pursue policies for the protection and promotion of democracy, human rights, multidimensional security, and integral development in the hemisphere. As the oldest multilateral body in the Western Hemisphere, the OAS remains the premier organ for political dialogue and in seeking to build resilience for its member states, particularly the more vulnerable. The OAS must therefore of necessity be at the forefront of international policies and rules that are more responsive to small states' needs. When we speak of building resilience, this hemispheric body must also commit to assisting small states access the critical financing. The OAS, based on its four pillars, must bring together member states to discuss ideas, build consensus and policy positions, and advocate on behalf of its constituents. Without this valuable support, many small states will be unable to fulfill the basic ideals and principles which this body holds there. Without critical support, many small and vulnerable states will be unable to respect, protect, and fulfill their human rights obligations. There will also be difficulties in addressing challenges that arise from our interconnectedness and global phenomena such as climate change, global displacement, and COVID-19 will continue to wreak havoc. We recognize that COVID-19 has diverted attention and resources away from other pressing challenges, such as security issues, the war on drugs, hunger, and gender inequality. Moreover, climate change still represents the greatest threat to humanity. To this end, Barbados has sponsored a resolution on climate change. 
The resolution entitled Advancing the Hemispheric Response to Climate Change in the Context of the COVID-19 Pandemic calls on all member states to take robust and integrated action to prevent and address the negative impacts of the COVID-19 pandemic, drive growth, build resilience, and accelerate the transition to low carbon economies. It also requests the General Secretary, Secretariat to use its good offices to advocate for new and accelerated financing solutions to advance the hemispheric response to the COVID-19 pandemic and climate change. As a SIDS, we recognize that we face an uneven burden in seeking to mitigate climate change, whilst at the same time working to secure increased development financing. As I have noted in Barbados's address to the 75th session of the general debate at the United Nations General Assembly, the greatest contributors to the climate crisis do not bear the consequences proportionately. Some countries provide suggestions on how small island development states should seek to mitigate climate change, whilst at the same time adopting measures that severely undermine our efforts. The impact of the pandemic has been felt across the hemisphere, and as member states deal with their own economic contractions, this organization's finances have also suffered as a result. In the year ahead, operating with a reduced budget ceiling, the OAS must prioritize efficiency and preserve critical mandates and ensure that our meetings have productive value for the people of the Americas. Even in the midst of the COVID-19 crisis, we cannot lose sight of the existential threat of climate change. Chair, it is deeply troubling that as of now, all current projections show that the Americas will miss its mitigation targets to lower global warming below 1.5 degrees Celsius above pre-industrial levels by 2030. Worse still, the resources that have been diverted towards this pandemic have significantly narrowed our fiscal space to meet our adaptation needs for the climate change. On this score, Barbados is heartened to be joined by 20 member states in the sponsorship of this resolution which galvanizes our collective advocacy to international financial institutions, permanent observer partners, and external donors to support the momentum of climate ambition in this hemisphere. The inter-American system has been buoyed by successfully contributing to the maintenance of peace and security in the hemisphere. This has been particularly evident through its electoral monitoring processes and fighting discrimination in all its forms, especially against women, the disabled, the marginalized and indigenous populations. And as its motto declares, in striving to attain more rights for more people. It is for this reason that the development pillar of the OAS not only remains critical to the organization's progress, but becomes even more relevant to the continued socioeconomic development of member states, particularly small developing states that at any period in the organization's history. The Executive Secretariat for Integral Development, SEDI, of the OAS has sought to refocus its work plan, developing initiatives to assist member states to address the challenges represented, presented by the COVID-19 pandemic. For these actions, they need to be commended for being timely in their response. These initiatives undertaken by SEDI are aimed at enhancing the competitiveness and greater digitization of micro, small, and medium-sized enterprises. Support for these sectors hard hit by the global pandemic is fully endorsed by Barbados. We also welcome the work being done to assist young scientists and entrepreneurs to adapt technology to develop innovative products and services. Initiatives like these are especially important at a time where economies are pressed to diversify. Additionally, viable alternatives, avenues of employment should be made available to our youth, particularly when traditional means of employment are closing. Barbados fully supports the adoption of this year's resolution on advancing hemispheric initiatives on integral development, particularly the impassioned call for member states to discuss access to international financing. Furthermore, 
the strengthening of international cooperation mechanisms, given the specific challenges of small island and low land development states, as well as low and middle income countries, to consider additional criteria to assess poverty and development of countries to include vulnerability, in addition to income status indicators, is indeed welcome. These discussions are critical to ensure meaningful strides are made towards attaining sustainable and climate resilient development for all our countries. The government of Barbados fully appreciates and embraces the principles of multilateralism. We believe that multilateralism remains even more critical at this stage. Our shared common interests and challenges underscore the belief that when we work together to create inclusive, secure, peaceful societies with equal opportunities for all, we are stronger in our unity. The coronavirus, which is too small to be seen with the naked eye, is no respecter of wealth or geographical size. Yet it has proven that it is only when we work together that we stand a chance to defeat this small but formidable foe. Barbados therefore remains committed to the continued exploration of increased access to concessional financing and greater cooperation on advancing dialogue on the equitable access to vaccines against COVID-19, affordable quality testing and surveillance testing to manage the community transmission impact in so many countries at this time. It is imperative, therefore, that we do not waver from our adherence to these principles and that we hold fast to the provisions of the founding documents of our organization, even when or especially when we are faced with crises as we inevitably will. At these difficult moments, it is incumbent on us to rely on dialogue, active inclusive dialogue that seeks to create and ensure an environment and conditions for growth and progress to thrive for the good of the majority. Mr. President, even as we continue to promote dialogue, member states must also remain committed and unwavering in strengthening wherever possible the resources, human and financial, of the Secretariat so that it can implement the mandates prioritized and approved by member states. Mandates which are designed to operate in the best interest of member states and which can only be achieved with the support of an efficient and effective secretariat. One thing remains clear, the world as we know it is forever changed and this change continues to manifest itself in ways hitherto unheard of and never before envisaged. A global novel virus has kept us sheltering in place, contained in our homes. Businesses have been forced to reorient the way they conduct their operations. To do otherwise is to create your own demise. Government's relationship with whom it served has also been altered significantly. At the individual level, our interactions with the outside world and even to each other may never be the same again. Faced with a common external threat, as states we are forced to look past our differences. COVID-19, while a formidable foe, presents us with a singularity of purpose that should help us reset and regroup. Recalibrate if we must. In recalibrating, our OAS too must be effective and efficient, developing a resilience that serves the needs of its member states. To do otherwise is to secure its demise, rendering it obsolete. I thank you, Mr. President. Thank you, Minister. We now invite the distinguished foreign minister from Belize, His Excellency Wilfred Ellington, to take the floor. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Honorable Darwin Henfield, Minister of Foreign Affairs of the Commonwealth of the Bahamas and Chairman of this Assembly, Secretary General of the Organization of American States, Luis Almagro, Assistant Secretary General, Nestor Mendez, 
fellow foreign ministers and delegations, ladies and gentlemen. Here, on behalf of the delegation from Belize, allow me to express my gratitude to the Organization of American States and its staff for its determination and innovation to make today's gathering possible, despite the fact that we are in the middle of a worldwide pandemic. We cannot underscore enough the importance of this assembly, especially now at a time when the trials and tribulations of everyday life have been magnified tenfold by the difficulties visited upon us by this dreaded and invisible force. The COVID-19 pandemic has affected our hemisphere more acutely than any other region in the world. Three of the four countries which have recorded the highest number of COVID-19 deaths are countries from our hemisphere. ECLAC estimates that Latin America and Caribbean economies will contract by 9% in 2020, putting our GDP back to the same level as 2010. Further, 2.7 million formal businesses will close. Unemployment will rise by 80 million to 44 million. Extreme is expected to rise by 4.5%, resulting in an additional 28 million persons joining ranks of the extreme poor. The toll of COVID-19 pandemic has magnified and exacerbated the inequalities that have long been present in many societies in our hemisphere. This reality underscores visibly the urgency of addressing more effectively development and challenges that our hemisphere faces. Therefore, we are compelled to reiterate or call for adequate resourcing the development pillar of the OAS if the OAS is to continue being relevant and integral to our hemisphere. As we begin the long road to recovery, it will be imperative to invest in education and skills training, in renewable energies, women and girls, MSMES, digital connectivity. The OAS is well equipped to support the member states on the common goal of recovering better and stronger and of accelerating our sustainable development. The MSME digitization program and digital skills programs are even more important to our economies as we rebuild. We also wish to applaud the work of CD for the technical assistance provided to small business development centers and their clients in priority areas such as financial literacy and management, productivity, building resilience and competitiveness. Not only are these an important aspect of education, they are a vital building block of a solid economic edifice that cannot be constructed without medium, small, and micro enterprises. Similarly, in energy, COVID-19 also revealed the intensive interconnectedness of our countries. Again, the OS has a critical role to play here in drawing our hemisphere closer together. Our recovery from COVID-19 presents a serendipitous opportunity to rebuild our communities, our countries, our hemisphere, so that they are fairer, more equal, greener, cleaner, and smarter. We are appreciative of the advocacy and commitment of the Secretary General on this issue. The SG has taken it upon his office to champion important global decision makers that the strict use of GDP per capita only as a basis for determining access to necessary financing is devoid not only of creativity, but is also unhinged from reality. The strict adherence to GDP per capita by FIs, when applied to nations whose economies are small, vulnerable to external shocks in unique ways, and to nations that stare at devastating storms sometimes on an annual basis, is not only wrong, but also inhumane in the most base of ways. We are grateful for his advocacy in this regard and call upon the international community to spare no effort to seek the necessary reform of the IFIs, apart from an orthodoxy 
that hurts our small nations. Financing the recovery must entail revisiting the anachronistic rules of the international financial system, which excludes small island developing states from access to grant financing, concessional resources, and debt standstill arrangements. In this respect, we are advocating for a SIDS compact, a commitment to SIDS specific policy solutions for financing, which includes addressing liquidity, debt cancellation, the participation of private creditors and debt swap instruments. Another troubling issue for the Caribbean and increasingly for some members of SICA is the de-risking of domestic banks that leaves local banks with the unenviable task of seeking new and open partnerships in regions outside our hemisphere. This new exposure, this new burden is unfair to harmony in trading relations that must not only exist in Americas, but must be strengthened. In this regard, we thank the SG again for also agreeing to bring attention to this difficult and potentially disastrous situation. While the COVID-19 pandemic has disrupted some plans and momentum for climate action, it has not diminished the urgency or danger of the climate emergency that our hemisphere and our planet is facing. Indeed, even before COVID-19, Belize was already grappling with a drought which had resulted in over $50 million loss in agriculture in Northern Belize. While managing COVID-19, Belize had to contend with Hurricane Nana, which impacted agriculture in Southern Belize. We, the small island developing states, live on the front line of the climate emergency. We cannot lose sight of this existential threat that climate change poses to small island and low-lying developing states. I wish to point out that the countries feeling the worst effects are not the countries creating the bulk of the greenhouse gases. It is time for these countries to begin to take on a greater responsibility for not only halting, but also reversing climate change. Thus, we call on all member states to recall their obligations on the Paris Accord and to pursue more ambitious, nationally determined contributions. Mr. Chairman, this sage and eminent gathering of member states called the OAS has several important obligations, not least among them being the voice of the most vulnerable of our citizens, regardless of race, religion, or national origin. Over the last few months, the America's racism and injustice have been front and center of global concern. We cannot ignore the many, many street protests by concerned citizens of all colors in the hundreds, perhaps thousands of communities all over the Americas. The killing of George Floyd was repulsive not only in North America, but in the hearts of all men and women of decency in the hemisphere reminded us that there is still work to be done in this regard. In December of last year, this precinct body led mostly by CARICOM, but supported by other like-minded states, resolved to condemn the racism that was evident in the southern part of our hemisphere. I say this to underscore the fact that racism is a cancer that must be fought from Alaska to Tierra del Fuego, whether cloaked in political expediency, or so-called freedom of speech, whether it's evil is manifested in halls of power or the frustration of the powerless. Racism is racism. It is evil and it must be made a thing of the past. Mr. Chair, may I take a minute now to emphasize the gratitude of the people of Belize to the family of Mr. Luis Alonso Munoz Sagastume who passed away earlier this year due to COVID-related conditions. Mr. Monia Sagastume died while on duty for the OAS adjacency zone mission to Belize and Guatemala. And in so doing, he gave the ultimate service for lasting peace in Austria. We extend to his family and to the OAS our deepest condolences and our most sincere appreciation for his service. Mr. Chair, colleagues, I'm pleased to bring to your attention a stellar example of how organizations 
like the OS, is making its mark for peace, cooperation, security, and development in the region. Having been in this seat since 2008, I'm a living witness to the OS being a positive force for good. The Secretariat, its leadership and its membership has continuously supported the efforts of Belize and Guatemala to settle the Guatemala territorial claim to Belize and to ensure peace in our region. Much has been achieved since 1st December 2000, when the Permanent Council formally committed its support to this process. It has not been an easy process for any of our governments. But in the 12 years that I've been Foreign Minister of Belize, Belize and Guatemala have, despite our differences, ratified and implemented a partial scope agreement. We have signed and obtained popular support in both countries for a special agreement to submit Guatemala's claim to the International Court of Justice, where the dispute is now being heard. In December 2014, Central American heads of states and government were in Placentia, Belize, where the witness or two countries signed 13 bilateral cooperation agreements in several areas of mutual interest. With stops and starts, the bilateral commission established under the agreement on confidence building measures of 2005 has been effective and it has helped to promote better bilateral relations. There are many more achievements I could list, but suffice it to say that none of these accomplishments would have been possible without the strong support and commitment of the OAS, its membership, the group of friends, and our Secretary Generals, past and present, as well as the able professionals among the Secretary of staff. I therefore wish to especially recognize Secretary General Almagro, my friend, for his personal and institutional leadership and encouragement. I want to recognize his special envoy, Ambassador Washington Abdallah, who has now moved on to serve his country of Uruguay at this eminent institution here in DC. The work of each of them is important and crucial for the success of our efforts for Belize and Guatemala to bring finality to a long-standing claim and for us to be able to fully normalize our relations. I thank you for your support and urge all of you to continue supporting this great start. And while I'm on the topic of gratitude, many thanks are also in order for each and every member state in this hemisphere for supporting Ambassador Nesta Mendes to a ter second term in office. It is not lost upon us that his second term was achieved by acclamation. Hermanos y hermanas, muchas gracias. Muchas, muchas gracias. All in all, Mr. Chair, this hemisphere is better off because of the work done at this institution. And on this my parting intervention, I take this opportunity to thank all member states for invariably showing kindness, respect, and willingness to listen and collaborate with my small and vulnerable country, Belize. This experience called the Organization of American States, while not without the imperfection that is but human springs hope eternal for a kinder, gentler world, one without the evil of race, inequality, and superiority. One where the smallest amongst us gets an honest hand in partnership for success and development. One where democracy becomes more embedded in our everyday life and our citizens are free from the torments of insecurities, whether perpetuated by a state or by criminal ambitions, one where we live in a better world. I will miss you all. I thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Minister, for your presentation. It would be remiss of me if I did not thank you personally, as Chair of this Assembly, for the service that you have rendered not only to your country, Belize, but to the entire region and our hemisphere. Uh, you have been distinguished in your service to us all, and we thank you. And I'm sure I speak for each of us when I say we shall sadly miss you. But I have your phone number and I know how to find you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Distinguished representatives, our agenda includes another activity that is scheduled to begin in a few moments. I therefore propose that we adjourn this session 
If you agree, I suggest that this plenary session take note of the interesting presentations by the heads of delegation and that they be duly recorded in the minutes. Pending statements will be presented when the second plenary session reconvenes, which is scheduled to take place today at 4 p.m. in the same virtual meeting room. The session will begin with the list of speakers as noted down by the secretary, the secretariat of the General Assembly. We now move to a break. <laughs>